All right, Book of Judges. We are three messages in, and just starting to delve into that first chapter. Uh, go ahead and read the verses. We've got a few things to cover for tonight. I don't know how long the message will be, um, but it should be important enough for us to get the doctrinal and the practical application out of a particular character, you know, have you ever asked yourself the question, why did the Lord bring this character to light? Why did he give me his story? You know, how did he make it into the Bible? Um, and there's always a reason God doesn't just write on accident, um, but it's up to us to figure out why. You know, sometimes it's to figure out practically why, what's the lesson I can learn for myself, which is usually what church people are always after. How can I live my best life now? And then there's the things that the Lord kind of tucks in there for those that he knows that are beyond interested in themselves and in their daily walks and want to just know everything that he is willing to show them. And for that, we have this character by the name of Adonai Bezek. Let's go ahead and read um, uh, verse, you know what, let me get there. I kind of peeked over to Isaiah. Um, let me get there myself. We'll read the first seven verses together. Okay. Now after the death of Joshua, it came to pass that the children of Israel asked the Lord, saying, Who shall go up for us against the Canaanites first to go fight against them? And the Lord said, Judah shall go up. Behold, I have delivered the land into his hand. We talked about this last week. You see that? That's past tense, delivered. It's a done deal. You're either going to believe God when he said it's done, or you're not going to believe God. Verse 3. And Judah said to Simeon, We got this, brother. We're all good. Thanks for offering your help, but the Lord said he's already delivered this into our hand. No, what did he say? He said, he said unto Simeon, his brother, Come up with me into my lot, that we may fight against the Canaanites, and I likewise will go with thee into thy lot. So Simeon went with him. Right, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. So they're putting their trust in an arm of flesh. That, that's what they're doing. And, and I mean, I understand it. I too am flesh and you are flesh. And sometimes you, you know, rather than trust God at his word, exactly at his word, we try to find a little extra encouragement to do what we know he's already given us the power to do. And Judah went up, and the Lord delivered the Canaanites and the Perizzites into their hand. And they slew of them in Bezek 10,000 men. And they found Adonai Bezek in Bezek, and they fought against him. And they slew the Canaanites and the Perizzites. But Adonai Bezek fled, and they pursued after him, and caught him, and cut off his thumbs and great toes. Thank you for that extra information, Lord, right? And Adonai Bezek said, Three score and ten kings, having their thumbs and their great toes cut off, gathered their meat under my table, as I have done, so God hath requited me. And they brought him to Jerusalem, and there he died. Of course, um, that wasn't just extra graphic information. There's a reason for it. Father, help us to see everything that we need to see from the word of truth tonight. And we give you praise for it, Lord. Thank you for giving us such a perfect book. Uh, may our hearts be uh, inclined towards it. Uh, may it correct us. May it lead us. Uh, may it um, chasten us, but also encourage us, Lord. May it, um, I guess, spank us and heal us at the same time, uh, Lord. And, and as uh, um, Brother Ethan prayed in regards to the book of James, may we be doers uh, of this word, Lord, and not hearers only, um, deceiving our own selves. We ask it now in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so in verse 5, it says that they found Adonai Bezek in Bezek, and they fought against him, and they slew the Canaanites and the Perizzites. Anyone know what Adonai means? Lord. Lord. Uh, 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 El would mean God. But Adonai means Lord. And typically when you see... Um, see it translated in your King James Bible. I can't say all every time because 
I've not looked at every translation of the word Lord. Um, but typically, it's not Jehovah, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. It's capital L, little O, little R, little D, Adonai. And that's supposed to be a reference to Jesus Christ. Whereas capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D is Jehovah. It's God the Father. But this man, he goes by the name of Adonai Bezek, which basically means the Lord of Bezek, right? He was found in Bezek. So what does that mean? He's the leader. He's the king. He's the governor. He's the prince. I don't know. Whatever you want to call him, he's leading Bezek. But what does actually Bezek mean? It means lightning. Interestingly enough, he is the Lord of lightning. He's connected to Canaanites and Perizzites, which typify what in the scripture? Anyone remember from last week? Pardon me? Well, sins, unconquered sins, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Canaanites, all those ites <laughs> are parasites in your body. That's what they are, and they need to be extracted. That's the picture. And, you know, some of them are a little harder than others. Some of them have iron chariots attached to them. And others are kind of like, okay, woo, you're out of here. You know, for me, drinking was easy. Simple. Uh, smoking was hard. Very, very hard for me. That was an iron chariot. It took a lot of prayer and, and uh, praying from other people for me as well. But praise the Lord, those are things of the past, right? And that's the point. I still have a few ites in my life, and I know that you do as well, right? We'd all be lying if we said our, all of our ites are kicked out, right? Yeah, exterminated. I think there's a, a, an antibacterial something you can take for them, right? So um, they're, again, they're connected to the Canaanites, parasites, or he is, typifying unconquered sins. He is the Lord of such. So the doctrinal type would be, he's the man of sin. 2 Thessalonians 2.3, he's a picture of Antichrist. A, a, a ruler that is going to cause the nation of Israel some trouble. Uh, spiritually, the typology would be that he would be Satan, the tempter, the king of sin, the leader of sin, uh, or what is uh, referred to in the scripture, scripture often as rebellion. Go to Luke chapter 10, and I want to show you something here. Quite interesting that the Lord says. The apostles bring to him a conversation about their power over unclean spirits. And the Lord says something quite interesting. Um, Luke 10, verse 17, 18, and 19 and the seventy returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. And he said unto them, way out in left field, right? I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. So you got this Adonai Bezek, which means Lord of Lightning. And all of a sudden, the Lord, in a conversation about unclean spirits, just says, by the way, I beheld Satan fall, fall from heaven as lightning. So this, this, is why you, this is why I study the Bible and why you should study the Bible. Because these things are there. They're for your, if you want it, <laughs> you can get it. Isaiah 14, go ahead and flip over there. Yes, learning what the word Bezek means helps. And, uh, you know, I am a King James guy, but I am, I am well aware that the Masoretic text was inspired and that the Textus Receptus was inspired, just as my eight King James English Bible is inspired. So I have no problem going to Greek and Hebrew just so long as I'm not using it in some show of vanity to try to correct the Bible. It doesn't correct the Bible. As far as I've always seen it in all my years of study, it has always made the Bible even better, and then the Bible has made Greek and Hebrew better. They all work together. Um, Isaiah 14, you know the story. 
verses 12 through 17. The Lord in his conversation um, about the king of Babylon, who is a type of what? Antichrist, who is Satan manifest in the flesh. All of a sudden, in his conversation towards the king of Babylon, begins to talk to Lucifer. You're going to see human beings as types of the man of sin who is Satan manifest in the flesh. That's why God, when he talks to some of these Assyrian kings, um, you know, and the Babylonian kings and the kings of Egypt, he's talking to them and then he's also not talking to them. He's looking right through them and who's controlling them and he's talking to the unclean spirit within them. Kind of like he talked to the man in the garden and said, you know, he, what's your name? My name's Bill. No, no. What's your name? Oh, we are legion. You know, he got beyond the physical and into the spiritual realm. Um, verse 12, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weak in the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. That's, that's not twinkly, twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder where you are. Those are angels. I'm going to go above all of them, he says. And, and I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. Where does Santa Claus dwell? In the North Pole. Why did they put him in the North Pole and not in the South Pole? Because he's an Adonai Bezek. He's, he's an antichrist. He's a story to steal the hearts of your children. I will ascend, Lucifer said, above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. I want to sit where he sits. That's why, if you think about what John and James asked, through mom, of course. But what they ask, you know, we want to sit on their right and left hand side, you know, in your, in your glory. You don't really know what you're asking here, guys. It's been asked before. Well, they actually wasn't asked, it was, I'm just going to go do it. So you're not as brazen, but be careful what spirit, you never know, you know even someone walking with the Lord, they walked with the Lord for three and a half years, personally. Satan spoke through Peter. Think about that. Every time you complain, every time I complain, every time you stoke the fires of rebellion or discord, complain about this, complain about that, I didn't like that message, I didn't like that church service, I wish they would have played that song, I wish the service was a little longer, I wish it was a little shorter, I wish they'd rearrange the chairs this way. I would... Careful. Just be careful. I will send above the heights of the clouds, I will be like the Most High, yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. They that see thee shall uh, narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble, that did shake kingdoms? Note, yes, he's talking to the king of Babylon. Who's he also talking to? Lucifer. Lucifer is the man that made the earth to tremble. Why is that important? I think it's important. Because God was manifest in the flesh. He is going to manifest in the flesh. When God did it, it was the mystery of godliness. When Satan does it, what does the Bible refer to it as? The mystery of iniquity. Uh, that made the world as a wilderness, right? Do I want to keep reading? Yeah. That made the world as a wilderness and destroyed the cities thereof that opened the house of his prisoners. Is this the man that destroyed all those things? How art thou fallen from heaven? Just as lightning 
falls from the first heaven to the earth. Satan fell from the third heaven. He is the prince in powers of the air. It's his realm. And so wherever there is rebellion, wherever there is sin, wherever there is reproach and contempt brought upon the counsel and authority of the word of God, it comes from the Lord of Lightning. Judah, and, Judah shall go up first, right? Judah shall go up. Judah went up with whom? Simeon. So Judah and Simeon were all, I mean, come on, it was just a little disobedient, right? Right? I mean, it was. It was just a little disobedient. So it was just a little bit satanic. That's it. I mean, really, if we start looking at sin in our lives as the cancer that it is, rebellion as what it is, you know, I mean, you wouldn't want a little cancer, right? right. You wouldn't drink a little poison. Right. But we're willing to be a little bit satanic. Well, Let's go to Daniel chapter 10. You know, for every sin we compromise, a stripe went on his back. Right? For every little thing, he bore it in his body on that cross. <laughs> Preacher, I'm going home. Uh, Daniel 10, verse 5. Then I lifted up mine eyes and looked. Behold, a certain man clothed in linen, whose loins were girt, girded with fine gold of euphaz. His body also was like the barrel, and his face is the appearance of what? Lightning. And his eyes as lamps of fire, and his arms as feet like in color to polish brass, and the voice of his words like the voice of a multitude. Well, now, who is this? Who's this referring to? Take a peek around the context. Go ahead. We'll wait. Who is it? It's the Lord. It's the real Lord of Lightning. It's not Santa. That's the guy that hangs out in Bezek. This is the real deal. This is the one that is making a list and checking it twice, and you better be found in that book of life. Amen. Right? Uh, look at Job 37. Job 37. So you, you do have a Lord of Lightning. His appearance is as lightning. And there's something else that he directs as lightning. Job 37, verses 1, 2, and 3. At this also my heart trembleth, and it is moved out of his place. Hear attentively the noise of his voice, and, that's, and the sound that goeth out of his mouth, he directeth it under the whole heaven and his lightning unto the ends of the earth. Getting that? He's putting his word and lightning kind of in the same context, like it's directed, the way he directs lightning to crack out of the ground. He's taking this book and he's just taking it and he's going crack and smacking somebody with it. Sorry, Steve. You were just there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> made for the real men. That's why I sit up there too, but just, just say, so you know. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Just tease and Ethan, relax back there. Unclench. Unclench everybody. <laughs> I know Ethan can handle it or I wouldn't have said anything. So again, who's the real Lord of Lightning? 
and who's attempting to be like him. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. One of these days we're going to have to do 2 Thessalonians. We've never studied that book. Got the rapture in there. Well, actually, that's, that would be 1 Thessalonians. You'd have to do them as a pair, right? You'd have to do 1 and 2 Thessalonians. Um, great doctrinal stuff, uh, prophetic stuff about Antichrist here in this chapter. Second, cha uh, second chapter of 2 Thessalonians, th verses 3 and 4. Let no man deceive you by any means. You know, there's a lot of talk about deception. In fact, when the disciples went up to Jesus and they said, Hey, Lord, you know, what's the sign of thy coming in the end of the world? The first thing out of Jesus' mouth is, Let no man deceive you. That's the first thing. And Christians couldn't care less. I mean, they really couldn't. You start to talk to them about how they're being deceived, and they're just like, they close their ears so quickly. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day, what's that day? The day of the Lord his fiery vengeance, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. I believe that that order is there for a reason. The falling away first and then the, the, the man of sin is revealed. I, I, I believe, and I could be wrong, I believe tucked away in that little comma is the rapture. Okay? So, well, why didn't he talk about the rapture there? See, there's no such thing as a rapture. He talked about it in the first, or in the, in the first book. This has got to be mentioned in every single verse for you to believe it. Man of sin will be revealed. He's referred to as the son of perdition. Why? So that when he referred to Judas as the son of perdition, you'd go, oh. It's amazing to me that people don't get it, you know. Read John chapter 13, 13, the number of rebellion. You see uh, uh, Judas there at the table with Jesus. He is the betrayer of Jesus Christ. Uh, he wanted the preeminence. He wanted the rule. He wanted uh, the Roman Empire to be cast aside so that the nation of Israel could rise into power. He was a very religious man. He uh, three times dips the sop. S-O-P, three times mentioned, son of perdition. He's letting you know who this is. But, but, you know, what do I know? The son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he, as God, mystery of iniquity, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. He's finally going to sit on that throne that he said, I will ascend to. It's not in that third heaven, because he isn't allowed in anymore. And then he's going to get kicked out of the second heaven. And then this is the last throne for him to appear on, and this is the one he'll appear on. And it'll be in the Jewish temple that has yet to be built, but the blueprints are there, and the altar has been built. Praise the Lord. Who is this? That's Adonai Z Bezek. He's a fraud. He's a copycat. He's not the real Lord of Lightning. He's just feigning to be. And the whole world wonders after him. Ooh, such a great leader. Revelation 13.3. Also, by the way, the number for rebellion. Where that beast will show up. Isn't that interesting? John chapter 13, Judas Iscariot. Revelation chapter 13, the beast rising up out of the pit. No, they're not the same. The whole world wonders after the beast. And Romans chapter 1 says the whole world does not like to retain God in their knowledge. They want the fake Lord of Lightning. They want Santa. They don't want Jesus. All right, how are we doing? Good? Let's uh, go back to Judges. Let's look at verses 6 and 7. And we'll deal on the practical side and call it an evening. But Adonai Bezek fled, and they pursued after him and caught him, cut off his thumbs and great toes. And Adonai Bezek said, Three score and ten kings having their thumbs and their great toes cut off, gathered their meat under my table. 
As I have done, so hath God requited me. And they brought him to Jerusalem, and there he died. Three score and ten. What's that? Seventy. Seventy. So the thumbs and the great toe, what do they represent? Ability. Power. So how so? Listen, besides intellect, it's what many, you know, scientists falsely so called, but many separate us from the animal world. Opposable thumbs. No thumb, no grip. No big toe, no waka. You try walking without big toes. You'd be walking on your heels, right? You couldn't do it. You couldn't do it. Adonai Bezek, what did he used to do? When capturing other kings, apparently 70 of them, he'd cut off these parts uh, so as to cut off their power and authority and make them little in his sight. And then according to what his own testimony was, he would throw scraps of food under the table and like there are animals. God bless you. Now here's the thing. They don't have thumbs. They keep, can't grab the food. So what are they probably doing? Like animals. Underneath the table, he's treating them like dogs. Bowing their head, trying to get whatever scraps that they can get. Why would a man do such a thing to another man? Why not? I have the power. It's funny. You know, it's, it's what children do to children before they've grown up and have developed empathy. You know, because kids will kind of like do whatever typically, well, I can beat you up, so I will. And until someone at the playground shows up that's tougher than me, right? It's very often, that's what, a, that's what a, an undisciplined child does. Okay, Proverbs 10. Take a peek there. Because I couldn't, I don't know about you, but I couldn't perceive of doing such a thing to somebody. Why humiliate someone you've already beaten? But then again, you know what, now that I can just correct myself now. I mean, I play with the kids. We win a game, I do a little dance. <laughs> There's something in us that's just not right. That's right. Proverbs 10, verse 23. It is as sport to a fool to do mischief. But a man of understanding hath wisdom. So why would a man do such a thing to all, you know, to 70 kings? Sport. Why not? I could. Who was going to stop me? The real Lord of Lightning. So now what did Adonai Bezek understand that most saved people do not understand? Turn to Galatians. Galatians 6. Verses 7 and 8. Be not deceived. Oh, it's like that keeps appearing. <laughs> Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. What's the context of that mockery? Because certainly people mock God. The context is no one's going to pull the wool over his eyes. He sees it all. And in due season, you're going to reap. Verse 8, for he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. I'm sorry, did I not read the second part of the verse 7? God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the spirit shall of the spirit reap life everlasting. Now, Leviticus 24, verse 19 says, this is the law of Moses. If a man cause a blemish in his neighbor, as he hath done, so shall it be done to him. So you cut off a man's big toe, 
you ought to have your big toe cut off. That's what the law says, national law for the nation of Israel. It's not Christian law, so that we're clear. No cutting off anyone's toes, all right? But it was national law for the nation of Israel. If someone did something physically to somebody, you did it right back to them. Without the law, because in Adonai Bezek did not have the law of Moses. Right? Safe to say? But he knew the law. Without the law. What's that? That's Romans 1. Go peek at that. Take a look at Romans 1, verses 18 through 20. Romans 1.18 says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. By the way, verse 18 there, that word hold there, it can mean a couple of different things. You know, it can mean hold as in cradle but it can also mean to withhold. And in the context here, that's what it means. It's saying that um, they're withholding. The, the word is right. I'm not correcting the Bible. It's just another meaning. They're withholding the truth. They're withholding it. They ignore it. They reject it. They withhold it. They withhold it from getting to you. Pastor, do you believe in conspiracies? Yeah. Yeah, because I understand that the fake Lord of Lightning is the God of this world. Verse 19, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, in who? Lost people. For God hath showed it unto them. How? What if they never read the law of Moses? Verse 20, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. So just from creation alone, you should be able to go, wait a minute here and put two and two together, you know, this, it can't, only a fool would say there's no God, right? Right. Um, clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even if they deny it, I think they get it here. Even his eternal power and Godhead so that they are without excuse. They have things written on their hearts. The law of God is written on, it's manifest, it's clearly seen by them. God revealed it to him. Before there was any law, man knows. He knows I shouldn't cheat on my wife. He knows I shouldn't kill somebody. He knows even as a child, I shouldn't lie. There's some shame that goes along with it until you sear your conscience to the point of no longer feeling, which the Bible also discusses that people can get past feeling. That's why, you know, more and more this world, I think, is becoming where... Um, more sociopathic, as they call it, where there's no empathy for anyone or anything anymore. They're getting past feeling. Yeah. So they're overstimulated here, right? With this, all this stuff, overstimulated and then just flowing information constantly, constantly, overstimulated but under empathetic. Yeah. Yeah. So Adonai Bezek, in the very spirit behind the rebellion of God's word, he found out in the, in the end that God's word shall stand. Satan knows the law. He can quote it better than any one of us. Of course, he'll misquote it because he's a liar. But he knows it better than any one of us. The Lord of Lightning gets it. He understands, hey, this was my time, I'm done. You know what, as I have done, the Lord has requited me. It was a good run. Why, didn't, why doesn't Satan just surrender now and go, okay, like, I read this book, I know it's going to... He doesn't believe it. Right. He believes I can get, I can still beat him. And then he'll get to the point of where every single word comes following down, right? I mean, and everything that God said was going to happen, happened as it happened. And the Antichrist is cast in the lake of fire, and Satan's cast in the lake of fire. And the last thing that is going to come out of his mouth in anyone's realm is, Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen. 
Every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess, even Adonai Bezek. His counsel will stand. So this is full circle from last week. Partial obedience yields partial victories. But it also yields negative consequences for disobedience. How long did Adonai Bezek lob off people's fingers and toes? Who knows? God knows. It's not listed, right? How many years did he safely sit at his table dining on his bread and guzzling his wine? Thinking, phew! <laughs> hey, give me a scrap! Come on, come on, watch this. Watch him, watch him. Proverbs 16, 18. Pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Adonai Bezek fall. Here it is. Satan's going to have a fall. And anyone that's filled with pride is going to have a fall. That's our spiritual lesson. That's a lesson for us to take home. Right? How do I live my best life now, preacher? Be obedient to God. And we've got, of course, our doctrinal typology of Antichrist or Satan manifest in the flesh. Um, his rule will be short, um, just as his uh, rebellion was uh, cruel and it knew no limits. Punishment will be eternal because his contempt for the Lord will likewise be eternal, as will everybody's who is in hell according to the book of Daniel. Thoughts? Yes, sir. This stuff is just interesting. I don't know if there's any connection or whatever, but when he went to Luke 10, um, in the Lord's head, verse 18, by the way, that's 6. 6, 6, 6, yes. He said, I be called Satan as the way you fall from heaven. But in verse 17, that, that number 70 is there as well as. Let me look here. Uh, Adonai and Bezak. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then 70 kings. I just thought of that. Let me see that. What was the reference again? Luke 10? 17, 70 yeah, and Satan, yeah, be, falling as lightning from heaven. That's eight, 6 plus 6 plus 6 is 18. That's definitely, that's the numerology there, um, which is the mark of the beast. And by the way, Satan coming down to earth as a man, mystery of iniquity. Yeah, 666, six, six, it's the number of a man. Yeah, that number 70 just showed up. I, I, I just thought it was interesting. Where is 70? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. Now, they were 70. Oh, no. Oh, think about that. You know, that's good, brother. These are 70 of the Lord's people. What did Adonai Bezek do? Who knows who he slew? They might have been godly men. This, that's what this is a type of. That's him coming after the nation of Israel. It's good. Thanks for the insight. Anything else? Father, thank you uh, for time in your word. It's always a blessing. It's an amazing book. The pro prophetic end of it, Lord, is uh, amazing, fun. We love to dig into it, talk about all these things. Uh, what I'm excited about is not so much talking about the man of sin, but knowing that the rapture is coming before that, revealing. And so I think, I hope, I echo everybody's sentiments when I say, even so, come Lord Jesus. We pray this now in your name. Amen. Amen.